I have to thank you very much. Of all the introductions I've ever received, that was the one I understood the least. <laughs> Although it strikes me, this is an amazing opportunity for me. This is the only audience I will ever speak to that finds it easier to pronounce my co-author's name than my name. <laughs> this is fantastic. This is never going to happen again. Um, as, as Asta says, what I want to talk to you about is this, this incredibly fast-changing world that we are now living in. And the message that I want to deliver is that even with all of the excitement, all of the overexcitement, all of the hype that we're hearing about the technology of artificial intelligence, for example, we are still underestimating that. And I want to give you a few examples that have just happened in the past couple years of why I believe that we are still underestimating what is happening in front of us, how it's going to change our lives, how it's going to change the world, and certainly how it's going to change the business world. So let me give you a couple things that have happened that just in the past couple years that have surprised even the insiders. There was a conference of artificial intelligence researchers in 2015, and so the organizers took advantage of that fact to ask a survey of all these insiders in artificial intelligence and to ask their estimates, their guesses, about how soon we would reach different milestones in the history of artificial intelligence. And one of the milestones that people were focused on was not playing chess, because for 20 years now, the best chess player in the world has been a piece of technology, not a human being. And in fact, chess is actually kind of uninteresting because the computers are so much better than we are at it. The gap right now between the top digital chess players and the top human chess players is, very, is huge. In fact, that gap is so big that a little while back, they asked a human grandmaster how he would prepare for a chess match against a computer. And he said, I'd bring a hammer. <laughs> so chess is really uninteresting. But when they asked these AI researchers about the Asian strategy game of Go, the answer was completely different. And in 2015, the consensus, the average guess about when we would see a computer Go champion was the year 2027. A lot of us know we actually now have a computer Go champion. As of about two years ago, in March of 2016, the world's best player of this ancient Asian strategy game of Go became a piece of technology, not a human being. And this was incredibly surprising. We were not anticipating this. What is even more surprising is not the fact that the technology beat the human master, but how the technology beat the human master. And when we tell the how story, I think we start to understand how profound this change is that we're seeing thanks to the progress in artificial intelligence. So I want to tell you the story about how the computer won. And to do that, we need to do just a tiny little bit of ghost strategy. Again, this was unanticipated. This, um, this victory happened in March of 2016. Here's where we were in December of 2015. We still thought this was an ancient game. It was going to foil the computers. They were not going to be any good at it. That's not true anymore. The how story is the more interesting story. So let's do a tiny bit of Go strategy. Go is like chess in that there are classic openings, the way you start the game. There are classic openings that you study and that you're expected to master when you're a beginning Go player. So if you go to any Go textbook, you'll see a diagram like this, which is a diagram of good, smart opening moves in the game of Go. And you'll notice something. Every one of these smart opening moves is either on the, the one, two, three, the third row in from the edge, or on the one, two, three, four, the fourth row in from the edge. And to oversimplify a little bit, the reason for this is if you make your opening move on the third row in, what you are signaling is, I want to play this game around the edges. 
That's where I'm more comfortable. That's where I feel like I'm a stronger player. So I want to play this game around the periphery of the board. If you make your opening move on the fourth row in, what you are signaling is I want to play for that big open territory in the middle. That's where I feel like I'm strong. That's where I feel like I'm better than you. And I really want to play that, this game in the middle of the board. If you make any other move early on in the game of Go, what you are signaling is I am not a very good Go player. And your teacher will slap your wrist and you'll go back and you'll study the textbook because this is how you play the game of Go. I want to stress, the game of Go, as far as we can tell, is about 3,000 years old. We have been studying this game for 3,000 years, and this is the wisdom that we've accumulated. And I want to tell you that because I want to show you what happened in the second game of the match between AlphaGo and Lee Sedol. Lee Sedol was a Korean Go player, incredibly talented, easily one of the top handful of Go players in the world. He lost that match to a technology called AlphaGo. And something happened in the second game of this five-game match that is making us re-examine 3,000 years of accumulated knowledge and wisdom about the game of Go. And you can go to the internet very easily and find pictures of what happened in game two on the 37th move of the game. So here it is. It's obvious what's crazy about this, right? We, we all understand completely what's happening. I probably need to highlight this a little bit. In this game, AlphaGo is playing black, and the 37th move is still pretty early in the history of the game. So on the 37th move, AlphaGo does this. It places its stone on the one, two, three, fifth row in from the edge, kind of in the middle of nowhere on the board. And it doesn't matter what language you want to follow, maybe not Icelandic, but in many languages, you can go find YouTube clips of the commenters that were following this game. And when this move happens, they all go, this makes no sense. This doesn't correspond to anything we understand about how to play this game. So you can watch this huge confusion among people who were following the game and trying to understand what was going on. We actually know what happened as a result. AlphaGo, the technology, was the victor, won this game. And what we think we are learning it's not exactly clear, but what we think we're learning is that AlphaGo was able to look far enough into the future and see enough different ways that the game could unfold that that stone out there in the middle of nowhere might turn out to be valuable by the end of the game. That's exactly what happened. AlphaGo went on and won the game. We humans do not play Go this way. We cannot play Go this way. So what's fascinating to me, and what I think is, is really powerful here, is not the idea that the computer plays the game the same way that we do, but a little bit better. It's actually doing something really different here. In the months since this victory happened, AlphaGo has played other super top-level players, and it's only getting better. So after Lee Sedol lost, uh, AlphaGo played a group of very top, Chinese players, and some of them were kind of confident before the match started. They were not as confident by the end. And after a, a Chinese player, a young, uh, amazingly talented Chinese player named Ke Zhe played against AlphaGo, he put something up on the Chinese equivalent of Twitter that I think is, is really, really powerful. He played against AlphaGo, and after he was done, he said, um... I don't think a single human being has touched the edge of truth in this thing that we do, in this game that we play. I find this unbelievable. We have played this game, we have studied it intently for at least 3,000 years. And this is an insider, this is a top player, this is a very confident person who went up, a piece, went up and competed against a piece of technology. And when he was done, said, nope, 
All of us human beings, we haven't touched the edge of truth here. Uh, This is what he looked like as he was playing against the technology. (laughs) This was not a comfortable experience for this guy at all. But this, this idea that we might not have touched the edge of truth is fascinating to me. It feels to me like in this domain, after 3,000 years of human study, and after all, we invented Go, our accumulated knowledge has brought us up to here, and what Kudja is saying is, there's a lot more room up here, and we only know how much more room is available because of what the technology, because of what this digital Go player is teaching us. And we're actually seeing this over and over. Uh, Go is a super interesting game, but it's what game theorists call a perfect information game. Both players know exactly all the information about the game. Poker is a completely different game because like all of us know who have played poker, you don't know what cards your opponent is holding. And because of that, the game has an entirely different flavor, an entirely different kind of complexity. And because the other player doesn't know what you have, you get to do all these wonderful human things like lie and deceive and try to bluff and and just be very, very clever and engage in these kinds of behavior. So poker is a completely different style of game very hard for computers to master this style of game that involves knowing what's in the brain of another human being and anticipating their moves and all of that. And it was the case that software, that computer poker players, they were good, but they could not beat the top human beings. Here's where we were in 2015. There was a competition between a system developed at Carnegie Mellon University and four top poker players in 2015 And at that time, three out of the four human beings were able to beat the computer pretty easily. Uh, That's, okay. So I read that, and I thought, okay, we humans still have some advantage in these kinds of games. There was a rematch last year. In 2027, a different version of the technology came along and once again played against four absolute top-level human beings in this extremely complicated, wide-open style of poker called Heads Up, No Limit, Texas Hold'em. One of, one of the most complicated games of poker to play. Uh, this is uh, what it looked like when they were playing, and the reason that guy does not look particularly happy while he's playing is he's losing. And in fact, two years later, all four human beings lost. These were four very good poker players. All four human beings lost against the technology. And again, there were some wonderful insights that came out after the end of the match from the players themselves, not from the AI researchers, not from the people that built the technology, but the human players had really interesting things to say. One of them said, wow, even though the, thing, the point about this game is that the computer does not know what cards I have, it really felt like the computer knew exactly what cards I had. This is, this is really bad news if you're a poker player, right? Don't show your cards. And he said, I want to be clear, I am not accusing the other team, I am not accusing the other technology of cheating. It was just that good at this extremely complicated, subtle game that we humans invented to play for ourselves. One of the craziest things to me, not only this is, is pretty crazy to me, one of the other crazy things about this is that the team at Carnegie Mellon that built this technology did not try at all to teach their software good poker strategy. They didn't do that at all. All they did, all they did, was build a technology that could learn from itself just by playing games of poker over and over and over and figuring out good strategies for itself. So the team built this environment and said, look, we don't know how to play poker. You figure it out. And the technology did to the point where it can beat the top human players and play in this way that makes the human beings think that they know what the cards are. Uh, Just again last year, there was a a team, the same team that built AlphaGo, built a different version of technology to play games. And this technology, again, was not programmed with any strategies, 
play, learned entirely from playing games against itself. And this one could play multiple games. So not just chess or not just Go, but both of those games and other ones as well. And uh, the results from this one, again, were pretty unbelievable. From a standing start, not knowing anything about the game of chess, another very subtle, complicated strategy game. The system started from knowing absolutely nothing, and in a matter of hours, achieved superhuman performance in the game of chess without knowing anything at the start. The, and, and again, the interesting thing to me is not just that the technology is better, it's that it is approaching the same task in a very, very different way. There was one computer scientist who was also a pretty good chess player who looked at this result and he said, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that the reason this technology is so good is because it did not learn from us. It was not limited. It was not constrained by human knowledge. Human knowledge is getting in the way. What we need to do is let the systems figure stuff out on their own. One of the people that built this technology is um, an unbelievably smart, talented guy who himself was a very, very good chess player when he was a teenager, but he didn't try to introduce his own knowledge into the system. He built a system that could learn on its own, but when he looked at the moves that the system made, when he looked at the moves that AlphaGo made, he said, wow, this is interesting. This does not play like a human being. It also does not play like any other chess program out there. It plays chess from another dimension like some alien intelligence that came in, took a look at this thing called chess, and figured out how to play it at a high level. And I love this notion that for the first time ever, we human beings have this other category of intelligence out there. And we can use different labels for it. We can call it an alien intelligence. We can call it artificial intelligence. I don't care about the label. I care deeply about this phenomenon that we might have for the first time ever, this colleague, this other kind of intelligence that can help us out, that does not learn from our history and our mistakes and our successes, and therefore is not constrained by those things, but can go off on its own and help us with really tough problems. Uh, we are seeing this not just with games. We're starting to see this exact same approach in the real world, and we're starting to see results from the real world, from the world of business as well. I want to give you a couple recent examples that I think are, are pretty fantastic. One of them comes from the world of biology, there is a set of microbes that we human beings use for a really, really important process called fermentation. And the reason I think it is so important is because that's how we get beer and wine. This is critically important for humanity. But we also get cheese, we get lots of other things. There are large-scale industrial processes that rely on fermentation. And the only way to make fermentation happen is we take these microbes, we feed them sugar, and they give us alcohol or acids or other substances that we, that we really like. Now, what we want to do, obviously, is we want to take these microbes and we want to figure out how to adjust them, how to tweak them, so they do a better job. They're more efficient, they give us exactly what we want. In other words, what we want to do with, with these, all these microbes is we want to make little tweaks to their genetics to get different versions that behave in the ways that we want them to. So obviously, we want to take what we know in genetics and biology and use it to adjust these microbes to be better for us. And the way we do that up until now has been with good old-fashioned science. You get people who know a lot about genetics, about biology, about yeast. They sit there at benches, they work with computers, they do these things called pipetting, and we use the amount of knowledge and human wisdom that we have built up over hundreds of years of studying biology. And in particular, starting from about 60 years ago, we understood how inheritance happens for the very first time because we started to see that this thing called the DNA molecule is responsible for inheritance and is how all this information called genes 
goes down from generation to generation. So once we understood that, we thought, great, we understand how this happens. Now, biology is about to get easy for us. And instead, the opposite has happened. And what we're learning instead is how unbelievably complicated things are. So I love this quote. We, we have 60, for 60 years, we've known how DNA works, except that we don't really know how DNA works very well at all. And evolution is still this really, really profound mystery to us. A lot of us thought that as of 2003, that situation would change. Because in 2003, we completely sequenced the genome of a human being for the first time. And of course, since then, we've, se we've completely sequenced the genome. We know every little bit on that huge molecule. We know how it looks for lots of different species, including these microbes that we're interested in. So for about 15 years, we've had the raw information. And the question is, how much has that helped us? And the answer is, it's helped us a little bit, obviously, but surprisingly little. There was so much optimism around the turn of the century when we sequenced the human genome, we were just going to unlock all these things. And that really hasn't happened. There was a beautiful six-word summary of decoding the human genome. And it said, <clears throat> bought the book, hard to read. So that's where we are. And what we're learning is just the life, these processes that turn the genome into a human being or a microbe, these are just phenomenally, it is weird how complicated they are. They, they make us understand this, the, the wisdom of this quote from a British biologist who said, look, life is not more complicated than you imagine. Life is more complicated than you are capable of imagining. That's just how complicated the universe is. There are lots of domains that feel like this to me. It could be genetics, it could be medicine, it could be curing cancer, it could be investing, it could be running a complicated supply chain, where we just have this kind of crazy complexity, where all of our accumulated work, our science, gets us to some level, and then it is really, really, really hard to make progress. So we have a new crop of companies out there that are saying, you know what, we're not even going to try. We're, we're not going to do science the old-fashioned way. We're going to bring together this really amazing new combination that we have of technology, automation, and computation, and we're going to try to do something different. So this is a startup back in the States called Zymergen that works on that microbe, that works on those fermentation microbes, but says, you know what, we are not even going to try to understand that complicated science where the genome turns into a change that we want out there. What we're gonna do instead is we're gonna take everything that we think we've learned, all these patterns that we see out there, we're gonna give it to a machine learning system. In other words, we're going to throw a, whole amount of, a huge amount of data and a huge amount of math at this problem. What we're not gonna throw at it is accumulated human knowledge about biology Lots of data, lots of math. It's gonna, that math is hopefully going to give us some good ideas about, you know, if you make this little change to the gene over here, we think you'll get a desirable outcome over here. We don't know why. We can't explain why. We don't care why. We just think that if you make this little change to the genome, you'll get the result that you want. They set up a test bed so that they could efficiently test all of the ideas that came out of the math, that came out of the machine learning system. And they've achieved some pretty interesting results so far. One of the results that they shared with me was that their old method, the company that they were working with, had been working on this problem for a decade. We want to take this microbe, make changes to its genes, that give us better performance. And they were working on it, you know, they got about 7% improvement in the era that they were interested in over the course of 10 years. Is that good? Is that bad? Can we do better? Who knows? They came along, the Zymergen came along, they got a 15% improvement in 12 months' time. So they were really accelerating the pace of improvement here. When they were able to help the company make a great deal more money, the profitability of this product increased a lot. And to me, the fundamentally interesting thing was when they looked at the actual 
recommendations that came out of this project. They, they recommended 15 different, you know what, if we think that if you change the genome over here, you're gonna get better performance out of the microbe over here. There were 15 of those changes that turned out to be beneficial. And the team showed these 15 changes to the scientists at the company. And they said, what do you think? Does this make sense to you? And the scientists looked at those 15 changes and they said, in three cases, they said, oh yeah, we, okay, we understand why that might be a good idea. That makes sense to us. There were three other changes where the scientists said, wow, that's, um, that's strange. But we think we can tell a story about why that change to the genome might have resulted in better performance. We, we can kind of, we can make a story up about that. In six cases, they said, we have no idea why this works. This makes, we have no science that helps us explain this. And in three cases, the beneficial change happened on a portion of the DNA molecule, a portion of the genome that had no known function whatsoever. It was supposed to be completely irrelevant for this microbe, for the life of this microbe. Turns out on that dead, that junk section of the genome, they recommended three changes that were actually beneficial here. So we are seeing very fast progress start to happen out there in industry when again, we do this really uncomfortable thing of walking away from our accumulated human knowledge and insight about an era of study and saying, just let the machines figure it out. I want to give you one more example from the energy sector, which I understand is a pretty big deal here in Iceland. This was a really cool project that came out of Google a while back. Uh, the DeepMind team thought that they had built a pretty powerful technology not just for playing games, not just for playing Go, but also for helping run very complicated infrastructure, very complicated equipment out there in the real world. So they went to the team at Google that runs all of the company's data centers, and they said, hey, why don't you turn over operation of one of your data centers to us, to our algorithm? And the response back from Google was, was really clear. They said, no. Like, we're not going to do that. Our data centers are incredibly important to us. They're mission critical. We're not going to give the control over to some algorithm. You might melt it down or freeze it or something. They kept trying. And once they were able to calm down the data center team, that they, were, that they could put safety measures in place, that they weren't going to blow up the facility, they finally got permission to run this experiment. And one of the DeepMind founders told us that when they were talking with the team that runs data centers, and after they finally got permission to run this experiment, the data center team said, okay, you can do this, but um, look, don't expect very much. We've worked on this problem a lot. This is a very important problem for Google, for us, for our careers. Managing the energy, being energy efficient is the single most important thing that we do. We can, we can hire the best people in the world at it. We can invest in it. We do research. We are, you know, maybe we're not completely optimal, but we're pretty close. So don't expect too much when you run this experiment. Uh, this is what actually happened when they ran this experiment. And on this graph, down is good. Down means more energy efficient. And what they noticed is as soon as they gave control over from the old-fashioned method, and the old-fashioned method was have extremely smart, educated, experienced, well-trained people making these critical decisions. As soon as they turned over control from that method to just let the algorithm make all the decisions, performance improved not by a little, but by a lot. The overall energy efficiency of this center improved by about 15%. And the cooling bill, the amount of money they had to spend to keep it from overheating, improved immediately by about 40%, 40%. The performance continued at that improved level. And then as soon as they ended the experiment and gave control back to the human beings, you see what happened to performance. It went back to its previous inferior level. So I find these really convincing demonstrations. They're startling to me, they're upsetting in some ways too, because these are cases 
where our accumulated human knowledge and insight and experience got us up to a level. And again, what we're seeing is that the machines are showing us not just as a little bit more possible, there's a whole lot more improvement, a whole lot more territory available ahead of what human beings have been able to come up with. I don't think these are the only examples that we're going to see in the future. I think we're going to see this happen over and over and over, which brings up a pretty fundamental question. Great, what are we supposed to do if what you're telling us is accurate and the technology can do these amazing things? What are we human beings supposed to do? The most common answer that we hear from that, well, we, hear, we hear a couple different things, um, but it's a, it's a complicated question, and the more you learn about human minds, the more likely it looks that we don't want them to do anything. <laughs> uh, let me tell you what I mean. I'll give you a very quick example of this. Um, would you raise your hand, please, if you have below average judgment? <laughs> Look around the room, please. Do you see all the hands up in the air? Okay, you, I'm sorry, you all realize this is mathematically impossible, right? Either we found the absolute 2,000 best people in Iceland, which I guess is possible, or a lot of us are walking around kidding ourselves about how good our judgment is. And let me be clear, we are kidding ourselves about how good our judgment is. Uh, our, our lack of insight, our overconfidence about our own judgment is an example of a cognitive bias that we human beings have. In other words, it's a, it's a bug or a flaw or something that doesn't work right with our computation. Overconfidence is one of them. It's a really important one. But if you go to Wikipedia and you read the article about the problems with our, human, with our human computational hardware, this article has 175 entries on it. We have a lot of bugs. And in fact, this article is so long that we've actually tried to summarize our problems graphically. This is a great poster. You should print this out and keep it in your office for when you're feeling overconfident. Every one of these is a problem with this, and they're graphically arranged to try to give you some overview of how many flaws our computation has. So in the face of this, if the machines are so awesome, and we are so flawed and buggy, good heavens, what are we good for in the future? One answer that we hear very often to that question is, okay, fine, we're flawed, we're buggy, the machines are awesome, we still need people to understand other people. That's one thing, that's one advantage that we have. That's true, it's a little bit less true than most of us think. Uh, Microsoft, just a couple years ago, announced that for the very first time, they be built a piece of technology that could understand this, understand conversational human speech, not as well as the ordinary person, but better than professionals better than the people whose job it is to listen to speech and type it out accurately, we are no longer the world champions at understanding us. Uh, many people think that, that we human beings are still the world champions at understanding other people's emotions. And what we have now, what we're learning, is right now the technology is better than the average man <laughs> at understanding the emotions of another. But that's not a really good test, right? The technology is getting better than the average human being, even including uh, women in this. The technologies are now better at understanding the emotional state of a human being. We are seeing really intriguing examples of companies starting to put this to use. Here is a, a rumor that was around the internet a couple years ago. I think this rumor is actually accurate. A couple people noticed that when they called up Apple, when they called up the customer support line at Apple, and they, started, uh, they, and they had a very frustrating experience, and they started to get angry, they were more likely to be immediately connected with the human operator. 
And what we think we're learning was that Apple deployed a technology that listened in the background. And if it started to seem like I was talking like this, they immediately gave me to a human being. So we have technology now that can do these things that we really used to think were purely human phenomenon. I don't believe that anymore. I think we have technologies that are phenomenally good at these emotional, read the other person kinds of things. So this brings up this question again. Wow, um, it, are you all thoroughly depressed right now? That wasn't actually my goal, because I think that we still do need human minds, the things that we are actually better at. We need them a lot, we need them differently, but we still need a lot of them, and I don't anticipate, even with all this crazy technology, I don't anticipate that the robots and the AI will eliminate all the human jobs anytime soon. I don't believe that at all. Let me try to tell you why. Here are some things where we are still unquestionably the best, and where even as I get to go around and talk to the experts, people who are building these technologies. They tell me that these will continue to be areas of human advantage and human specialty. The first one is, it is amazing how hard it is to teach a computer common sense. I'm dead serious about this. They just make the most unbelievably dumb mistakes. They don't understand how the world works. Will they get there? I don't know, they're not there yet, and they continue to make really just unbelievably bad mistakes. We had a great example of this recently in the business world. A couple years ago, there was a terrorist attack in downtown Sydney, Australia. And like you can imagine, a lot of people, as, soon as the attack was unfolding, wanted to leave downtown Sydney, Australia, and go anywhere else. So the, the algorithms that were in charge of pricing at Uber saw this situation, and they did exactly what they were programmed to do. The algorithm said, wow, demand is going up a lot in downtown Sydney right now. Economics 101, let's raise prices. Now, this might have been economically the smart thing to do right then. It was ethically the wrong thing to do, and it was a public relations nightmare for the company. Again, the algorithms were doing what we asked them to do, but they didn't realize that in this particular human situation, you should not be guided by economics. So companies like Uber have built in these interruptions where a human being can look at situations and say, no, 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 we don't, don't increase prices right now. That's a really terrible idea. But we've learned we need to have human beings in the loop or at least able to intervene in these kinds of situations. Because if we leave the, the algorithms to themselves, wow, we're gonna have nightmares, ethical nightmares, public relations nightmares on our hands. And we are still terrible at building technologies that know what question to go ask next, what problem to tackle, what opportunity to pursue, what to go next in the world. The computers do not understand it. They have no insight into that. Reminds me of a couple wonderful quotes that we've heard. One is actually from Pablo Picasso. In the 1970s, Picasso was shown these new things called computers for the very first time. And this was his response. He said, ah, they're useless. All they can do is give you answers. I love that, right? I think that's exactly half right and half wrong. The wrong part is, it is not useless to get answers. It is really useful to get answers. But more fundamentally, questions are what matters deeply. Voltaire said, judge someone not by their answers, but by their questions. I love that. And we look around, and I look at what actual innovators and entrepreneurs and leaders do. They are asking the right questions. The way they answer those questions is changing very rapidly. But this job of asking questions about the world, this is still a very human job. Uh, I made the case earlier that computers and technology are getting better at understanding a human being's speech, at assessing the emotional state of another human being. Here's what computers are still terrible at, influencing that emotional state. 
motivating somebody, making them excited about something, giving them a vision, having, organizing them so they pursue a goal. These are things we call it management or leadership or whatever. These are really important things to do, and the technologies are lousy at them. When I think about one of the last jobs that will ever go over to a piece of technology, I think of a, a children's football coach. And I mean that in all seriousness, the ability to take a bunch of 10-year-olds and get them to do anything, get them to listen to anybody, organize them, teach them how to play a game, deal with their frustrations and activate their solidarity, this is a really human job. I cannot imagine the human soccer football coach that will be effective here. It turns out this shows up in the evidence very clearly. When we look around and we look at the skills that companies are willing to pay for, obviously they're willing to pay for STEM skills. If you're a great programmer, if you're a data scientist, of course. What they're even more willing to pay for are the skills of managing people, negotiating, persuading, organizing a team, coordinating. These kinds of things are very valuable today. I think they're going to be more valuable tomorrow. And then a final human skill that I want to talk about is the ability to work with these unbelievably powerful new machines. And especially as the machines get more and more capable, the ability to partner effectively with them becomes a very valuable ability here. Uh, this is a graphical rendering of one of the tallest buildings in Shanghai, China, a, sky a new skyscraper in the Pudong neighborhood in Shanghai. What I find fascinating about this building, it looks great, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful, very energy efficient, very materials efficient building the first version of which did not come from a, a blank sheet of paper and a human designer. The first version of the building came from a computer. And it was pretty complete. It said, look, you told us you want to be able to have this much capacity, have this many square feet of office space, this level of energy efficiency. You told us about all the winds that will come through this part of China. We have to be able to resist those winds. Great. Here's a building that will do all of those things. What do you think of it? And the human designer said, oh, wow, thanks a lot. You know what? We actually want to have it look a little bit different. We want it to twist differently. The client says they might want the windows to be a little bit different. So what the human designers could do was intervene and iterate and improve this design in a very, very efficient way because they weren't starting from scratch and they weren't doing all the boring calculations that you have to do to understand every little change that you want to make. They could work in partnership with this piece of technology to efficiently, very quickly design something that's going to go have an impact and be valuable out there in the world. So I think that's a great um, indication of how we're going to partner in the future. And I think a good note that I want to end on, here's what the future looks like to me. Very often, the machines are going to be opening up new territory. They're going to be doing this work of showing us how much more improvement, how much more opportunity is ahead of us, what the new territory looks like. And then we minds, our human beings and our minds, our brilliant minds, our buggy minds, our minds are going to go explore that territory together with the new machine intelligences that we have. I'm incredibly excited about that future. I wish you all good luck creating it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.